Uh, we're reading from Romans chapter 5, verses 12 through 21. And if you are using one of the blue Bibles in the back, it is on page 1751. Romans 5, starting in verse 12. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people because all sinned, to be sure, sin was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not charged against anyone's account when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even over those who did not sin by breaking a command, as did Adam, who was a pattern of the one to come. But the gift is not like the trespass, for if the many died by the trespass of the one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many. Nor can the gift of God be compared with the result of one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation, but the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. For if by the trespass of the one man, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? Consequently, just as one trespass resulted in condemnation for all people, so also one righteous act resulted in justification and life for all people. For just as through the disobedience of the one man the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man the many will be made righteous. The law was brought in so that the trespass might increase. But where sin increased, grace increased all the more, so that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Well, good morning, church family. Uh, to you that are here in the building, to you that are watching online with us this morning, and I would guess that there's uh, some guests with us here for Mother's Day or watching online uh, as a guest of ours. And again, we would just want to welcome you uh, being a part of what's going on here at, at our church this morning. I want to remind you that we are now in our third week of what is going to be a nine-part sermon series, one that we're calling, We Believe, Exploring Our Statement of Faith. And I hope that you're planning on joining us uh, for the next two Sundays, especially as we continue this sermon series with two more guest speakers. Now next week, we're going to have Mark Ravel with us. He's the Director of Training and Development for Reach Global. And uh, Mark's going to be helping us think through the doctrine of the church, what it means for us to be gospel people. Then in two weeks, we're going to have with us uh, Kevin Complin. He's the president of the Evangelical Free Church of America. Kevin's topic on that Sunday is going to be Article 4 of our Statement of Faith, the person of Jesus Christ. So really for this month of May, we're blessed to have some very heavy hitters coming to preach in our pulpit, but today it's my turn. So on this Mother's Day Sunday, we're going to look at a passage from the book of Romans as we consider together Article 3 of our Statement of Faith on the subject of the human condition. Article 3 reads as follows. It says, We believe that God created Adam and Eve in His image, but they sinned when tempted by Satan. In union with Adam, human beings are sinners by nature and by choice, alienated from God and under His wrath. Only through God's saving work in Jesus Christ can we be rescued, reconciled, and renewed. Now, recently I came across a uh, special issue of a magazine, and it was entitled, A Hundred People Who Changed the world. You can probably think of some folks that might be on that list of a hundred people that changed the world. There were names as I looked down through that list that I figured would be there. Uh, philosophers and, and scientists, people like Aristotle, Isaac Newton, also listed great women and men of 
of history, uh, Queen Elizabeth I, Emperor Constantine. And then there were some more modern world changers, people like Ray Kroc of McDonald's or Apple's Steve Jobs. But in that list of 100 people who changed the world, I noticed that there were two glaring omissions. You know, two people who radically changed this world for everyone who ever lived. And I'm, of course, speaking about Adam and Eve. I invite you, if you haven't already, turn with me to Romans chapter 5 as we consider this subject, the human condition. In particular, we're going to look at what does the Bible say about sin. Now, if you've spent any time reading through the book of Romans, you probably know that this is one of the more weighty portions of Scripture. There's a lot of places in the Bible that we could turn to if we want to learn what the Bible says about sin. One of those could be that we we turn back to Genesis chapter 3, where it talks about Adam and Eve. In fact, we're going to consider that passage just in a moment, but, but Romans chapter 5, I think, is one of the most significant passages in all of the Bible on this particular topic, especially where it speaks to us about why it is that sin has become a universal problem. Now, in Romans chapter 1, through really the first half of chapter 3, Paul is making the case that all people, whether Jew or Gentile, all people have sinned against God and thus are deserving of God's wrath. We could sum up that whole section with Paul's quotation uh, from Psalm 14. Paul starts out in uh, chapter 3, verse 9. He says, what shall we conclude then? Do we have any advantage Not at all, for we have already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are all under the power of sin. As it is written, and here's where he's quoting from Psalm 14, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away, and they have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. And so Paul knew that it was necessary to first address the the gravity of the bad news in order to fully appreciate the glory of the good news. So then in the second half of chapter 3 through the first half of chapter 5, Paul then explains how it is that God has made a way of salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And he closes that section in the first part of Romans chapter 5 by saying, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if, while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to Him through the death of His Son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through His life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. And so that brings us to our passage. And here in Romans chapter 5, the second half of that chapter, uh, Paul anticipates a very serious question. He says, "If, if sin has made such a universal impact on the entire human race, so that billions of people are now under God's wrath then how can the work of just one person, namely Jesus Christ, how can can one person affect so many people for the good? So we're going to turn to Romans chapter 5 and verse 12. 
And there Paul says, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people because all sinned. Now I'm going to spend the bulk of our time unpacking just this one verse. And we're going to briefly look at the rest of the chapter. But I think verse 12 is so foundational to our understanding of our human condition that it is worth camping out here. First, we need to talk about sin itself. Because three times in this verse, Paul mentions this word sin. We need to ask this question, well, what is sin? Now, that's a different question from asking, what are sins or what is sinful? Because Paul isn't differentiating here between the things that are good and the things that are evil. If we go back to chapter 3 for a second, we see that Paul saw there in that chapter that sin is a power And he believed that all people are subject to this power. Back in verse 9 of chapter 3, he said, The Jews and Gentiles alike are all under the power of sin. And so that means that sin is not just the evil things that we do. Sin is the power that enslaves all people. In fact, later in this very passage, Paul is going to say that sin reigns. And in future chapters in Romans, he'll say that sin is a power that demands our obedience, that it deceives sinners, that it produces in the sinner death. Now, Paul is not suggesting that sin is a who. He's not saying sin is the devil or sin is some evil figure. But in personifying sin... Paul is showing us that in our fallen state, that all of us, all people, are subject to sin's power. I appreciate how one author defines this word sin. He says, sin is the power in human beings that has the effect of corrupting human thought and word and deed so that they displease God and make their authors guilty. Now, once we've understood that sin is not only a power that's at work in us, in every human being, but also that it's a power that that holds us in its grip, well, then I think we can see that there is no earthly solution, either within us or available to us, that could break those chains. And so Paul will go on to say in Romans chapter 7, For I know that the good itself does not dwell in me, that is in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do. But the evil I do, uh, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. So how is it that sin has become this universal plight? Well, again, let's look back at Romans chapter 5, verse 12, where Paul tells us in that verse that sin entered the world through one man. If you think about that, the fact that Paul says that sin entered the world means that there was a time when sin was not in the world. And two Sundays ago, when we were looking at Genesis chapter 1, we saw in that passage that with every successive day of creation, God looked at what he made and he saw that it was good. And even when God made the first man and woman, and he he created them in his image, and he placed them into the Garden of Eden, God saw that his creation, as he says, was very good. But We know that things did not stay very good for very long. 
Because when Paul says in verse 12 that sin entered the world through one man, Paul is speaking there about the very first man, the one that God named Adam. Now, this account of the creation of Adam and his wife Eve, it's found in Genesis chapters 1 and 2, and then the story of the fall of Adam and Eve and the entrance of sin into the world, well, that's found in Genesis chapter 3. And we don't have time to turn to those passages and look at them in detail today, but in order for us to understand Paul's argument in Romans chapter 5, it is very important that we keep those stories in mind. But even as I say that, by referring to Genesis 1 through 3 as as stories, I don't want to suggest for a second that Adam and Eve are mythological characters in some sort of biblical fairy tale. Now, even though many people discount the notion that Adam and Eve were real people, uh, we we would beg to differ. Now, some suggest that in this Genesis account, really Adam is some sort of a a generic stand-in for humanity, that that his name, which in Hebrew means man, it just simply points to the fact that he's some fictional representation of mankind. But you see, the Apostle Paul, who was writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he believed that Adam was as real as the Old Testament hero Moses, and he was just as real as the Lord Jesus Christ. And even though he didn't refer to the first couple by name, even Jesus spoke of Adam and Eve as real people. For example, in Matthew chapter 19, it says, Haven't you read, Jesus replied, that at the beginning The Creator made them male and female and said, For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. But you see, when Adam and Eve first disobeyed God and sin entered the world, we're also told in our passage that something else then came with it. Again, look back at Romans 5, verse 12, where Paul says that sin entered the world through one man and death through sin. You see, sin's entrance into the world, it it opened the door for death. And again, we could bounce back to the opening chapters of Genesis and the news that with sin comes death. Well, it would have been no surprise And it should have been no surprise even for Adam because God had warned him about the consequences of rebelling against his Creator. Genesis 2 says, The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden. But you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will certainly die. So when Eve willfully disobeyed God's command and and ate from this forbidden tree and then shared this fruit with her husband, at that very moment, Adam and Eve died. Now physically, they didn't drop dead right then and there, But spiritually, their rebellion, it resulted in their alienation from their Creator. And so Genesis 3 ends with God driving out Adam and Eve out from the Garden of Eden and now restricting their access to the tree of life. And so when sin entered the world through Adam and death through sin, Paul goes on to say in Romans 5.12 that in this way death came to all people, because all sinned. And so beginning with Adam and Eve and with every successive generation, the power of death now reigns. The NIV says it, that death came to all people. The English Standard Version translates it this way. It says, death spread to all men and women. Now it gets a bit tricky here because Paul doesn't exactly tell us 
how Adam's sin resulted in the death for all people, but we can see this link between Adam's sin and our death. And so Christians throughout history, they've, they've tried to explain this relationship in various ways. Some have suggested that Adam was merely a bad apple, pun intended, uh, and that people die because they follow Adam's sinful example. These folks would argue that people are born morally good, but because they choose to sin just like Adam did, well, they die just like Adam did. But I don't think this is at all what Scripture teaches. Because, for example, David says in Psalm 51, verse 5, Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. And then Paul, writing to the church in Ephesus, he says of our human condition in Ephesians chapter 2, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. And he says, like the rest, we were, by nature, deserving of wrath. Now, other people have, have taken a look at this, and they've understood that what's going on here is what we've, we've inherited from Adam and Eve is a, is a corrupted nature, that we're born with this bent toward sin and toward rebellion against God. And I would say there's no doubt that that is true. But though this fact may be implied in Romans 5, and I know that it's supported elsewhere in Scripture, I think right here Paul is saying something even more. Because when Paul says in verse 12 that death came to all people because all sinned, he is saying that in some sense, when Adam sinned, we sinned. I have to admit how that works out, this idea that before any of us were even born, somehow we sinned in and with Adam, it's a bit of a mystery. Because Paul doesn't explain how this is the case, he merely states that it's true. But we do see this same idea a bit more clearly down in verses 18 and 19, where Paul says, one trespass resulted in condemnation for all people. And then in verse 19, through the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners. I do think that our EFCA statement of faith actually captures this tension very well in Article 3 in the phrase, in union with Adam, human beings are sinners by nature and by choice. And what that means is that in our union with Adam, we are counted guilty before God. But it also means that we're declared guilty before God because of our very own sin and our own acts of rebellion through Him. Now, at first glance, when we read those kinds of things, we might think, well, that sounds totally unfair that God would hold us accountable for something that Adam did on our behalf. But having established this bad news that we are, as our statement of faith says, sinners by nature and by choice, now I think we can fully appreciate the good news of the gospel. Because also in Article 3, we confess that we believe that only through God's saving work in Jesus Christ can we be rescued and reconciled and renewed. And so Paul picks up then in the passage in verse 13, and he says, To be sure, sin was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not charged to anyone's account where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even over those who did not sin by breaking a command as Adam did. Adam 
who is a pattern of the one to come. Now that's a key phrase there. Adam is a pattern of the one to come. Right there at the end of verse 14, Paul says that Adam is a a pattern. Or as the ESV translates it, Adam was a a type of the one to come. And what Paul's going to do here is he's going to make a comparison between this first Adam, through whom sin and death came into the world, and he's going to compare him to this true and better Adam who was to come and who would bring forgiveness and eternal life into the world, a world that was ruled by sin and death. And so I mentioned at the beginning of this message that Paul anticipates a very serious question. The question that if if the sin of just one man has now left such a universal impact on the entire human race, then how possibly could the work of just one person Jesus Christ, how how could that affect so many people for the good? And here Paul's going to give his answer. He says first that the grace given through Jesus Christ is, is so much greater than the devastation that is done through Adam's sin. He says that in verses 15 through 17. Follow along with me as I read those. He says, but the gift is not like the trespass. For if the many died by the trespass of the one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? Nor can the gift of God be compared with the result of one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation, but the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. For if by the trespass of the one man death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? What he's saying here is this, where Adam's selfish act brought death to all people, Christ's selfless act is an offer of grace for the many. Where Adam's one sin brought judgment and and condemnation to all, Christ's justifying work covers the sins of the many who come in faith. Where Adam's trespass introduced the reign of death into the world, those who receive God's gracious gift, well, they will reign in life because of Jesus Christ. It's telling us that in all of human history, no one brought more devastation to the entire human race than the one whom God called Adam. But only one man can overturn that devastation done in Adam by one gift of grace, the one whom God calls Son. The second thing Paul says to conclude this passage is that although one man's act of disobedience brought all people a sentence of death, through his own act of obedience, Christ offers to all who believe the promise of eternal life. He says this in verses 18 to the end of the chapter. Consequently, just as one trespass resulted in condemnation for all people, so also one righteous act resulted in justification and life for all people. For just as through the disobedience of the one man the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man the many will be made righteous. The law was brought in so that the trespass trespass might increase. But where sin increased... Grace increased all the more. So that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through the righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, in our exploration of our statement of faith over the coming weeks, we're going to dig deeper into these subjects, these doctrines of the person of Christ and and the work of Christ. We're going to get there when we come to Articles 4 and 5. But for now, 
consider this. In disobedience to God, the man, Adam, and his wife came to the tree, and in one act of selfish rebellion, he took for himself what was not his, and thus he brought sin and death into the world for all people. But in obedience to his Father, the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, came to the cross with his bride in mind. And in one act of selfless sacrifice, he took upon himself what was not his, our sin. And thus he brought justification and life to all who would trust in him. Folks, this doctrine of our human condition and the problem of sin, it is an ugly thing. But when we look at this in the contrast, look at it in contrast to the the good news of the gospel, hopefully we will see the beauty of what has been done for us and the glory of God that is shown through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I know that thinking through and thinking about our own sin and our own sinfulness, God, it is a heavy subject. Lord, I'm sure that as we reflect even personally, we can bring to mind areas of our life where we have, we've rebelled against you, where we've disobeyed your, your word. Father, where we've turned away from your will for us, and we've gone in a completely opposite direction. Father, we know that the consequences of this, Lord, is eternal separation from you. But Father, I'm thankful that the bad news is not the end of the story. Just as Paul is showing us how sin came into this world and why it is that we are counted sinners, Father, I rejoice that there is hope in Jesus Christ. Father, that we would find redemption and reconciliation and restoration through the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, as we think about these weighty topics today, may we turn our attention to Christ and what He's done for us. We ask this in His name. Amen.